Washington. I am the head of Forest Europe, head of Forest Europe Subcommission at the International Forest Student Association. I'm also a master's student at the University of Padova in Italy. And today, I welcome us to this discussion and this webinar on what is forest education up to in Europe and Africa and an insight into the regional reports on forest education. So before I start, uh, I'd like to introduce my co-moderator, Vera Stenberg, and wish she's from Forest Europe and currently based in Germany. And I welcome all of us to today's meeting. Just some housekeeping rules. I want to thank all our speakers, our panelists, and everybody who has joined this meeting. So for some housekeeping rule, rule, I want to inform you that this meeting has been recorded as well as been transmitted live on Forest Europe LinkedIn page. Also, uh, this meeting will be uploaded later on the YouTube, just for your information. Also, you could keep your mic muted or video switch off if your connection is bad, and you could drop your questions via the chat, and please specify to whom you want to ask a question to. And we'll take a good picture at the end of this meeting for the social media. And at the end, we all have opportunity to share the initiatives in the chats to inform others. So I welcome Isabella to take the opening speech on behalf of IFSA. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Alex, for the introduction. My name is Isabel Claire de La Paz, and I currently serve uh, IFSA as the internal counselor as part of the board of this association. IFSA, or in its whole name, the International Forestry Students Association, is the largest network of students of forestry and related fields worldwide, connecting over 11,000 students from more than 60 countries with each other, as well as with our professional partners and experts in the field, and being a platform through which the voice of youth can be heard. Our vision is a world that appreciates forests. And since we are a student organization completely run by and for students, our aim is to contribute to this vision through enhancing forest education worldwide. This is perfectly in line with the project of global forest education on whose outputs this webinar focuses and which is one of many examples of IFSA's involvement and activity in the forest education field. This webinar focuses on the regional assessments from Africa and Europe, which are the two continents covering four out of seven IFSA regions, namely Northern and Southern Africa and Northern and Southern Europe, accounting together for 74 local committees from 41 countries and roughly 8,000 members of IFSA. This webinar is hence of a high importance for us as the, or as the association, as well as directly for our members who have the possibility to discuss and learn about the current state of forestry education in these two regions and how their needs as students can be addressed. I would like to welcome you all here and thank you on behalf of IFSA for joining today to hear and discuss such an important theme that forest education is for the future of both our forests and us as a society. And now I hand over the word to Santiago. Thank you, everyone. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, we are going to watch here um, introduction video from UFRO. So let me first check my screen. Forests and trees are diverse and complex and cover about one third of the world's land base. They grow in different climates and environments and on different soils. They come in all shapes and sizes, in groups or alone, have different needs and offer various goods and services. The livelihoods of more than a quarter of the Earth's population depend on forests. This is why scientists worldwide want to know more about forests and trees. They want to understand exactly how they grow, what makes them healthy, and how to use them. And they want to help them cope with impacts from an increasing world population and climate change. As forests and trees are often at risk of being harmed or lost. For these scientists, the International Union of Forest Research Organizations, UFRO, 
has developed a global network for voluntary cooperation. Open to all individuals and organizations dedicated to forest and forest products research and related disciplines. It offers opportunities to meet, work together, exchange ideas, access information and present findings. This avoids duplication, fosters scientific excellence and increases the visibility of research. Scientists like forests are very diverse. They have different interests and needs and work in different environments. UFRO provides a convenient structure where they can fit in perfectly. Nine divisions with their research groups and working parties are the backbone of this structure. They cover overarching forest-related themes such as civiculture, management, genetics, pests and diseases, economics or social and policy issues. For cross-cutting key topics, UFRO establishes task forces. UFRO also offers capacity building for researchers from economically disadvantaged countries. It seeks to strengthen education on forests and increase cooperation with related scientific disciplines and stakeholder groups. UFRO participates in global policy processes and provides scientific analyses for decision makers. Always with a view to reaching the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Currently, UFRO unites more than 15,000 scientists in almost 700 member organizations in 125 countries. Together they contribute to the knowledge needed to ensure that all people benefit now and in future years from the economic, social and environmental goods and services forests and trees provide. UFRO, Interconnecting Forests, Science and People. So, um, after this video from EFI and Forest Europe, we want to, we want to, sorry, to thanks IFSA and UFRO for the collaboration with this uh, uh, webinar. And I'm holding back to Vera. Thank you, Santiago. I would also like to welcome you all on behalf of Forest Europe. Um, so this webinar today is co-organized by the three organizations. Um, as Alex introduced myself already, I will be co-moderating today. Um, I work for the Forest Europe Liaison Unit um, in Bonn, and here I'm responsible for green jobs and forest education. What is Forest Europe? Well, Forest Europe is the voluntary high-level uh, political process which was founded in 1990, and it's an intergovernmental dialogue on, on cooperation. We have 45 uh, member states and the European Union as signatories and more than 45 um, observer organizations or countries. And this is great for uh, networking, for informal talks and dialogues. And also, for example, IFSA and UFRO are um, part of the observer organizations. So this is how the webinar today is possible. Um, at the moment, um, Forest Europe is chaired by Germany. Um, and together with Slovakia, Sweden, and Turkey, we uh, have the General Coordinating Committee. Some of the achievements of Forest Europe include, for example, the agreed definition on sustainable forest management in 1993, um, but also the publication of the states of European forests every five years, and um, an agreement on criteria and indicator what actually is a healthy forest and a sustainably managed forest. We have uh, one work stream dedicated for green jobs and forest education. And this is where I'm in charge for. And we have here, for example, an expert group working on green jobs. We are cooperating with the Thun Institute on a report on data and statistics on how actually is the situation on um, the green forest jobs. We organize webinars uh, as today, for example, together with IFSA and UFRO. Uh, we have also uh, an open house I would like to invite you on the 5th of July, where we will explain in detail what Forest Europe is. But we also organized, for example, a Grow Green Job campaign on Instagram, which is a communication campaign where you can tag and share your own green job and get inspired by different short videos on, on what is possible in the forest sector regarding old and tradi traditional, but also new jobs along the whole value chain. 
I'm looking forward to today's meeting and I'm happy that you all connected and took the time today. Um, it's going to be very interesting with the African and uh, European perspective on forest education. And I'm also very curious about the questions which will come from the audience later. So we have a dedicated time slot when we have time for your questions. And uh, with this, I would like to introduce Mr. James Kungu, who will give the first presentation today. Professor James Kungu is a professor of forestry and climate change, and he is currently working at the University College in um, Constitution College at Kenyatta University. And he holds a bachelor and master from this university in forestry and a PhD in forestry from the university in the Philippines. He's the executive secretary of the African Network for Agriculture, Agroforestry and Natural Resources Education, ANAFI. And um, before taking up his current positions, um, he was responsible um, uh, and served for the, as a chairman in the Department of Environmental Sciences and as a Dean for School of Environmental Studies. He was also the chairman of the ANAFE um, Education for East and Central Africa Region Network. So he's definitely an expert in this field and he has supervised many master and PhD students and publishes a lot. So welcome James, and we are looking forward to your presentation. The floor is yours. So I'm saying that just as uh, Santiago uh, has rightly put it, whether it is at the global level or at the continental or even at the national level, forests play a very significant role. And I can say that in Africa, especially when it comes to the rural areas and also in urban areas among the poor people, to them, forestry becomes very, very important. You can go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Yes, I'm saying that uh, when you look at the law of forestry, how much it contributes to the livelihood, whether it is as a source of food, of different materials, it plays a very significant role. And therefore, when you look at forest education, forest education become a key to building knowledge. Building knowledge, not only at a very early age from the primary school, but all the way to the universities. It also play a very significant role when it comes to skill and shared values. And I can say that this building knowledge and shared values and people having the right skill are the what may refer to a sustainable forest management. And because of that, forest education must adapt to the many challenges that is facing the forest sector, not only in Africa, but also in the world. Next slide, please. Okay. I'm saying that the aim was to appraise the current status of formal forest education at all education levels in Africa. And we were to identify gaps and areas that need to be strengthened as far as forest education is concerned. The survey was also to provide information on key initiatives and actors working to evaluate or to enhance forest education. And finally, it was to present recommendation of action that could be taken to strengthen forest education in African region. And for this survey, we covered the following levels of education. We covered the primary education in most countries ranging from five years or six years to 12 years or to some, going all the way to 13 years. Secondary education in most countries covering from 12 or 13 to 17 or 18 years. We also cover technical and vocational education or what we refer to as TVET. And finally, there was tertiary education in universities and 
colleges. Next slide, please. For our methodology, and let me say that uh, there are quite a number of people that were involved in this. As uh, somebody has mentioned, the, this was covering uh, the whole uh, the, the whole world. And I'm happy to report uh, that uh, we had a very good uh, guidance from FAO. And I can say that there was an online survey which involves statistical sampling and snowball samples. There were also two regional consultation meetings that we held, one covering the agrophone countries, which was based here in Kenya. And there was another one in uh, Frakfon, which was done in Niger, in West Africa. And there was also a literature review. I can say that this was done, especially when we are we're having a lot of challenges with COVID. Next slide, please. Uh, for African continent, these are the countries that were uh, sampled. And these countries, we chose them based on their location, on their population size, and also the forest cover. So, on West Africa, those are the country we also covered uh, Central Africa and Eastern and Southern Africa. Next slide, please. And what was the key finding from the survey? I can say at the primary school level, we found that forest related topics the, in many countries, they are not at all included in their curriculum. And where they are included, it is only to a limited extent. We also found that majority of the respond, uh, respondents felt that forest related topics should be included in the primary school curriculum. At the secondary school level, we found that the main challenge were resources. Many countries reported that forest education resources were limited to a certain extent. And also teachers' resources, we found they were not at all available. And where they were available, they were at a limited to a certain extent. At secondary schools, it also came out that majority of the students were not motivated to join a forest program, either at technical, vocational training, or even at the university college level. And when we looked at the TVET level, what came out is that the training of most students, it is done for employment in the formal sector. So the training is geared toward for more employment. We also found that the teaching tools, they are grossly inadequate. And there is also lack of government policies that connect Tibet forest programs and what the ministry in charge of forestry is doing in many countries. Next slide. And at the bachelor's level, what we found was that the student engagement in forest related activities outside their universities was limited to a certain extent. It also came out very clearly that digital tools in many countries are not used. And where they are used, it is done to a limited extent. And because of this, it also came out very clearly that digital learning tools were identified to be very much variable supplementing learning or teaching in forestry. People felt if we can be able, they can be able to be provided with the digital learning tools, things will be 
far much better at bachelor's level. And finally, there was also at the master's and PhD level. And what came out is that training at postgraduate level, the current, the way it is currently done only prepares students moderately or very much for the job market. It also came out that affordable, affordable continuing education and training both informal and done degree education to update and expand the skills was found not to be there at all or to be at a limited extent. And just like at bachelor's level, it was also found that digital learning tool for forest education at postgraduate level were not used at all in some institution and where it is used, it is to a limited extent. And majority of the respondents reported that if digital learning tools can be used, it can be a very variable supplement at postgraduate level. Next slide, Vela. And out of that, uh, I can say this is just uh, some of the findings that I've been able to, uh, to, to, to pull out. There is a very nice document on the same. What we can, uh, what we recommended is that at the primary school level, there's the need to reveal the primary school curriculum so that forestry can be included in that curriculum. We also found, or we also recommended the need to retool teachers and also to promote out of school activities. And in many countries, it was, we recommend the need to promote traditional and indigenous knowledge as teachers teach forestry related topics in primary schools. And one of the things that we also recommended is providing the primary school, uh, primary school with the short movies and also the need to develop experiential learning materials. At secondary schools, we also recommended the need to retool the teachers and also to expose students to out of school activities. And at TVET level. Hello, Professor. Sorry, you have just one minute left. Okay, at the TVET level, the need for curriculum review and also introduction of soft skill and entrepreneurship courses, which we found missing. And the need for the government to allocate more resources and to promote digital learning and ICT facilities. Yes, the next slide. At bachelor's need for curriculum review, we also recommended the need for job characterization and collaboration among universities and colleges in Africa. And at master's and PhD level, we recommended allocation of more resources, equipping lecturer, university lecturer with the necessary pedagogical and technical skills, and also coming up with the need evidence-based uh, innovative solution. Next slide. I think that is the last one. And I can say that uh, that is just a summary of the full fighting that we found when we carried out this uh, survey in many countries in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor James. And uh, it's really exciting um, to know about the different uh, information you found from your report, as well as the recommendation. And we'll quickly go straight to the presentation of Dr. Micah, and I'm going to introduce him shortly. Dr. Micah is a university lecturer in forest economics at the University of Helsinki, Finland, 
He's also the deputy head of the department in charge of public engagement and communication. Michael's research interests are ecosystem services and education. He's an acting coordinator of Forest Education Research Group in AIFO, and now working as consultant in this FAO AIFO Attitude Forest Education Project. Michael is also a CEO and a co-founder of an education startup called Forum for Edo. I welcome Micah to share the results from the European side. Micah, welcome. You can unmute Mike, Mika. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for these kind kind words. It's really, really honor to be here. I, I'm so pleased that you invited me. Um, so I will I will present some results from the very same same study that James just introduced uh, this global forest education study 2021. So we started at the very beginning of, of year 20, and you know what happened. <laughs> uh, so everything changed completely. This was supposed to be very quick, let's say quick and dirty uh, study within a couple of months, but we ended up with doing this more than one year. Uh, so this was supposed to be much, much smaller study that, that ha happened uh, finally. Uh, my colleagues here at Europe was uh, on an energy and Niklas Sandström. We were, <clears throat> we are all from the University of Helsinki and also uh, working together with the uh, a new startup uh, forum for Edu. Um, the aims change were was already describing describing the aims. And, and also the, the donor, the Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture in Germany. Uh, here you can see logos of all the partners. So the main partners were FAO, ITTO, UFRO. And here are the regional local, local partners. And uh, I can see that this, I can say that this was a really big project. We were more than 20 people uh, having those meetings every, every week all over the world. Uh, planning the inventory, which was the main main aim of the study, the the, the survey, and then and executing it later on. So the study framework, it's good to know and always to have this kind of a framework when you do a study. We were thinking that there are some needs which are coming from the general goals like sustainable development goals, uh, and then we have more specific needs, which are coming from the uh, labor market. And these are uh, fulfilled by uh, education, which takes, uh, which has a ground in a way from the institutions and organizations who, who do uh, education. They have some resources like uh, learning materials and, and learning environments including physical and, and digital environments. And, and at the end of the day, the most important resource is the human resources, teachers and other, other members of the, of the institutions. <clears throat> sorry, sorry about our, our docs. I... Yep. Uh... One of the things once you are working home and there are also some others working. So uh, when you put them together, uh, these like uh, needs and demand and supply and resources, you will get really what's happening here in a different levels. And, 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 and James was already describing those levels. And finally, what's happening is that graduates and they they uh, go out to the society, they have some learning outcomes, they have something that they can do uh, to fulfill the needs, uh, the social needs and, and the demand in the labor market. Okay, so we had three kind of uh, groups of people who were, who were uh, in the targeting the survey, we have professionals, 
mainly uh, talking about the needs and, 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 and demand. And we have teachers and students. And I'm, I'm uh, focusing in my presentation only at the university and college level. So they are the levels of associates, which, which was very rare uh, here in Europe, bachelor's level and master's and doctoral, doctoral uh, levels. And good to, good to just to mention that what we mean with forest education is that, of course, forestry and forest sciences, but also other programs who are closely related to, to forest and trees. Um, so uh, these methods was all they were already described like a literature review. This is something really huge that we made. And the survey, this is the, this is the global data. And then we had regional consultations in, 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 in five, five regions. And uh, Europe, we had uh, uh, data from uh, professionals. You see here the numbers. I'm not going to read them. Totally 450, 53 uh, numbers. Some results. Um, about First of all, about the enrollment, and then um, curricula and teaching approaches and then about the and then about the working life and employability um, let's start from the enrollment um, the tweet was uh, found to be with, with a low reputation uh, in terms of 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 higher higher education and uh, the global, globally, this trend is, is, is heterogeneous. So some programs, they are doing well in terms of, of the number of, of the students, and, and some, some um, are uh, with decreasing number of students. So this is uh, something to, to uh, think about it uh, and to do study later on. Challenges for gender, race, and ethnicity minorities we found to enroll for state education. Some results from curricula. We found on the bachelor level that, that uh, especially uh, insufficiency were covered forest and human health, trees and gender issues, ethnicity issues, indigenous knowledge, cultural values, and creative thinking. And in master level, uh, urban forestry, traditional and indigenous uh, knowledge again, and, and cultural values. Uh, what was what was okay was this kind of a, like a, let's say more traditional issues like forest and climate change, forest mapping, planning, silviculture, and, uh, and a master and doctoral level also biodiversity, soils and, and forest ecology. And uh, results from the teaching approaches show that uh, what what is really they're not yet very much used is, is enhanced media. This is, this is a, like a, a very advanced technology. It is still, it is still uh, in a waiting room, how to say. Uh, okay, uh, outside of school activities, students are not so much involved in an uh, in internship. So uh, here you see that not at all, or to a limited extent, it was more than 20% and, and moderately to uh, add it. So we can hardly get half of the students that feel, feel like that, that they have availability of internship. Employability. Mm. Uh, this was interesting uh, because uh, uh, if we, if we have a look on the all respondents, this was not seen uh, a problem. Gender was not, not at all a limiting factor. But uh, if we have a, a look more uh, closely to women, this was, this, was really a, this was really a problem to find a decent job. Uh, this is the number, I will, I, I will skip this one. So the discussion data was somewhat limited, of course. We could have had more time was really, this COVID area was really 
challenging. Uh, and then uh, we found many new topics that, that should be incorporated into curricula. Um, uh, especially these are related to gender, race and ethnicity issues and traditional knowledge and, and cultural values and human health. Uh, these tra traditional things like silviculture and for forest planning, they are okay. And what is also typical and we found here is that professionals, they are the most uh, critical ones. Teachers and students are much more happy, happy with the, happy with the uh, education. So conclusions and recommendations. Teachers, teachers need support in pedagogy. This is something that we found. Um, uh, you have to remember that we, we had a lot of, lot of data and a lot of results. I, I just show you some, some highlights here and there, but we, we found this uh, from the, uh, from the uh, regional consultations, especially that teachers need support in pedagogy. They can uh, do much better in terms of generic skills. Um, uh, also these topics that I already mentioned, how to incorporate them into teaching. And then the idea could be that we should have some kind of a place where we can discuss uh, the common global core curricula. What are really the most essential topics that everyone in any country had to learn if, if you enter in forest education? This platform is missing today. Digital education opportunities like change mentioned, this is important. We have to have a platform for courses, learning materials for teachers, teachers and, and teachers and, and students. So we can increase employability and internship opportunities also maybe using this kind of a platform. And uh, what EUFRO is doing, EUFRO Research Group, Forest Education 609 is going to organize Forest Education Symposium next year. And the topic is especially related to, to these platforms. There is already a, a pilot uh, called Forestra and Forum for Edo is also working with, towards these kind of a platforms. So that's all folks, thank you. Thank you, Mika. It's very interesting findings and I can see the double challenge with the uh, Corona. So thank you very much that you could um, present today. And um, so we will join, uh, we will come now with having setting the scene uh, with these two presentations um, into our, um, uh, Mika, if you can, yes, thank you for stopping sharing your slides. Um, we will have now a panel discussion between um, three students or early career scientists who will ask questions to James and Mika. And it's my pleasure to present uh, our uh, three panelists briefly. So we have uh, Dr. Mined Nago, and um, she holds a PhD in the environmental governance from the um, university in Germany. And her doctoral work focuses on forest and climate change cooperation politics in the Congo Basin. Her areas of expertise are forest and climate change policies, forest diplomacy, and um, north-south cooperation, international relations. She's currently the deputy coordinator of the Aforpolis Initiative, and she's also an alumni from the Eufro EFI Young Scientist Scholarship. Welcome, Minet. Thank you. Then we have uh, Mary. Mary Ogunleye is the forestry and wood technology graduate from the Federal University of Technology in Nigeria. And she's currently in an Erasmus Mundus Scholarship in Sustainable Forest and Nature Management at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. Welcome, Mary. Thank you very much. And last but not least, we have Isabel de la Paz. She introduced already Ipsa. She's also one of our panelists today. Um, Isabel is a Bachelor of Science student in, of forestry at the University in the Philippines. She's specializing in urban forestry. She currently serves as the international counselor of the International Forestry Students Association, IFSA and was also already part in the UNECE FAO Regional Forum, as well as the World Forestry Congress, um, and is also holding a Professional Development Award from April this year. So welcome, Isabel, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. We've got about 30 minutes, um, so please keep uh, the answers uh, brief and concise so everybody has a chance to speak. 
And um, I would uh, hand over firstly to uh, Minette asking her first question. Uh, thank you, Vera, uh, for giving me the floor and thank you for the brilliant presentation. Uh, the topic is very interesting. And um, I will start uh, by asking a first question. I think I will address the question to, I will address the question to uh, Professor James. Uh, from your work, Professor, um, and also from the work of Mika, I guess you guys, uh, I see, I mean, you guys have collaborated. Uh, what differences uh, do you see in the forest educational system from uh, Europe and, and, and Africa so far? Thanks, would you like to start or? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Minette. Uh, yeah, it is true. We this is one project covering different countries in all the continent of the world. And what I can say is that when you compare Europe with Africa, in Africa we are talking about many countries having the challenge of technology in schools. You don't find that problem in Europe. So I can say that the use of technology came out so clearly that though it was a major challenge in Africa, it is not a challenge in Europe as far as teaching forestry is concerned. Yes, I can definitely agree. We, we can see it every time when once I have some something like a true meeting or something that internet connections, for example, in Africa is, is not so good. And, and, and res resources, all in all, resources are, are much more smaller in, in Africa. They were even somehow abundant. Resources were somehow even abundant in Europe and in, in North, North America. We, we were able to see that in, in the study. So, so if I can add up something before uh, I give the floor to my colleagues, so that's why I will come back to the recommendation of James and uh, the recommendations are very interesting, but uh, from my perspective, it's difficult to dissociate uh, the question of forest education with the uh, development uh, prospect issues uh, going on in Africa. So from my perspective, to, to make uh, this recommendation, uh, enough strong and uh, and to give a real chance to this uh, uh, recommendation to be implemented and bring uh, a substantial change. We need to link it uh, somehow to the uh, 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 development issues going on because I think uh, as I, when I saw, for example, the recommendation or the issues uh, in the primary uh, uh, system, we, we we noticed, for example, that uh, forest. Uh, I'm missing you. I mean, so why? I, I mean, I think this this is all this is somehow linked to the development issues or the development prospect uh, going on in Africa. So that's why I, from my perspective, I I found the recommendation interesting, but they weren't, from my perspective, strong enough to be implemented and bring uh, a, a, a concrete uh, or a substantial change in the issue going on. Yeah, thank you, Minette. I don't know whether you have read the report for Africa. Not all the report, just the summary. Uh, have you gotten the, the actual report or you are just relying on the presentation I've made? Just summary and the presentation, just the, the summary and the presentation. Yes, because what you need to realize is that development play a very significant role where in determining the kind of education that you have in a particular country. A good example is like when we talk about technology, issues to do with the, let's say like if it is issues to do with the, what we are doing using the Zoom. You find countries like Kenya and others, let's say like when it comes to the internet, connectivity is so high, but we still have some countries that are very, very poor. And all these, you can be able to relate it to the development of the country. One of the thing, one of the question I have seen, or somebody 
has raised up an issue, Agibata from Nigeria, who is saying that some of them who are studying forestry, they feel like they have no future. But you realize that in my recommendation, we put in the need to include enterprises, enterprise training in forestry. Why do I say this? Because many of our students, including my own, when they go to the university, they are looking for what I call white collar job. I move in the city of Nalobi and I, I find so many people who have started enterprises, forestry enterprises. They say like students, but you find these are not forestry students. These are people who have never gone to the university or have never learned forestry. Why? Because they are good in enterprises. That is why I'm saying we need to look at the curriculum. And not only looking at the curriculum, you need to look at how do you deliver the curriculum and the aspect of the lecturers undergoing pedagogic training come in. If it is the students, we are saying you don't just need to teach a student in the classroom. You need to expose them to the field. So you need, that is what I'm saying, you need to read the whole a document in totality. And then you'll be able to see, because for every sector, we made clear recommendation on what needs to be done, including the policy changes that need to be done. So I recommend that you read the whole, uh, the whole document. Thank you. Oh, really? okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and it's also, I mean, important to keep in mind that most people probably will only have a glimpse of the report. So it's great to have this discussion today. And I would like to give the floor now to Mary for her question. Thank you, Vera. Um, uh, I would like to direct my question, my first question to Professor James. I so much connected with what you just said and um, I've been an, a background in the African country, one of the African countries. Uh, I want to leverage on your experience and exposure so far. So you identify technology as one of the differences. Um, have you identified any other differences that poses as a gap between African country and um, Europe? And um, what, are the, what are the things to be done to overcome these differences? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for... That is who? That is a Motu, Motu Nalayo. I don't know. You can I, call me Mary. <laughs> <laughs> yes, one of the things that uh, you realize, as I am say, I have said, is the resources. Resources that government allocate to institutions matters a lot. I can say that uh, it is because of. Um, the amount of resources that is allocated that determine also so many things. But we are saying one of the things that you may realize is quite uh, important in Africa. And I, I did that uh, purposely when I, I, I put the picture of an old man training a very small, a very young boy is the issue to do with the traditional knowledge. Traditional knowledge become very, very important in the way we teach our forestry. Unfortunately, I can say that sometimes when I, I have been teaching forestry, I, I visit, I, I did my postgraduate in Asia, I, I visit Europe many times. And for both Asia and Africa, and also South America, you realize traditional knowledge in education become very, very important. But what do we do? Most of the time, we also tend to borrow so much from Europe. So I can say there is still much with a lot of benefit that we can also be able to use. But I can say that uh, the problem we also have is where, as I said, in Tibet education, and this one you may also uh, find it also at the, uh, at the bachelors at the university level. 
the connection between the university and the government needs, that gap. So that, yes, we know at the university level, we are universal. We are training people who can be able to fit and work anywhere in the world. But at the same time, we need to train people who are going to solve the problems that different countries in Africa are facing. And when we know that, this will help us, even as we do our curriculum review, the curriculum will be there to meet the needs of the society, both at the local and at the global level. And for things to be done right, I need to say governments need to give resources to learning institutions in Africa. I can say there is resources, but priorities sometimes. And this one, I, or like when I look at the, uh, the, 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 the amount of resources given to different sectors in different countries in Africa, you find in many countries, university education or education in general is suffering. But to you sharing university education, like when I look in my country, I find we have a lot of now resources going to Tibet rather than to the university education. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. You know, when I read the reports, uh, it was very intriguing. And one thing I want to ask regarding the recommendation to the government is that I found out in, in let's say Europe, in fact, it is Europe, the concern for nature is at the point or the core of the government. But coming to Africa, the concern for nature protection, sustainable development is not at the core center of the government. So if the report is recommending that governments should try to put this in place, how do you think the, the professionals can put nature at the core center, the core interest of the government in Africa? Because I just feel that with this, there will be a change and maybe a kind of commitment from the government to the universities. What can you say about that, sir? Thank you. You know, for you to put resources somewhere, you need to appreciate. And that is why to me, looking at the education from the primary education level becomes very, very important. And I can say that uh, when you look at uh, the Europe, Europe has also undergone their own challenges. And that is why the, 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 the government are acting the way they are acting. For us, we don't need, for Africa, we don't need to undergo the same problems so that we can be able in the future to behave differently the way Europe is behaving. So I agree with you. There is need for people to understand the importance, the value of conservation, the value of nature. Unfortunately, maybe some, some countries, they may have so many challenges and that become like the people not looking at it. Currently, I'm looking at uh, what we call nature-based solution to disaster risk reduction. And you realize that many of the problems that we may be having could be solved by just taking care of the environment. And it is us now to help the government to understand that we are not just conserving that forest for tree. There is biodiversity, there is the aspect of the lane, there is the aspect of climate change like that. And when they are able to see the true value of that, then more resources will be given to do research in that area. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much. Indeed, the holistic approach is needed. Um, and time is, of course, also a very big issue. Um, I would now like to give the floor to Isabel, please, to ask her a question. Thank you, Vera. And once again, I am Isabel de la Paz. I am a junior forestry student from the University of the Philippines, Las Banas. And you may be wondering why I'm here today. 
in this webinar as a representative of European students, even though I am from the Philippines. And I have always wanted to pursue my master's or even my PhD in a university in Europe. So now that I'm still in my bachelor's, I am gathering all the information that I can get about the big differences between forestry education in Asia and in Europe to set my expectations. So this leads me to my first question addressed to Sir Nika. So what would be your main recommendation to solve or to overcome these differences between Africa and um, Europe for our generation from your point of view? Oh, thanks, Isabel. It's a huge question. I mean, forestry and forest education is just a very small uh, topic in the society. It's uh, even in Finland, where the forestry is a big thing. Even in this country, the forest education is less than less than one percent. Please mute, mute my, my microphone. Someone is making some noise. It is, it is less than 1% of all education. So, I mean, I mean, these are, these are the topics that are not in our hands in, 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 in many parts. So how the societies, how they evolve, how the economies are evolving. We have seen COVID, we have seen what's happening now in U Ukraine and things like that. They are not in our, our hands. Uh, what we could do is to do together, for example, research projects, north, south, south type of things. We could have common programs, short courses, master programs, let's see. Let's say um, we can have also um, something like, uh, Let's say entrepreneur thing is very important. I, I put some my ideas in a, in, a, in a chat. Please please have a look what's happening in, in, in Europe, in, in, in Finland. I, I still remember, let's say 10 years ago, and uh, not to mention when I was studying, <laughs> entrepreneurship was not popular at all. O always no students were thinking to be an entrepreneur. But today, that's really in fashion. And one implication, one really high level implication is this slush event organized by students. They say it is the world's, world's leading startup event. There are something like seven or 10,000 people here every year in Finland. It's high cost to participate, but you may have a look. There are many free uh, videos. You can get some ideas. You can organize something like this and uh, that's not something that we have to wait. We can do it by ourselves. Just some, some ideas. Thanks. Thank you, Sir Mika. And yeah, you mentioned that um, entrepreneurship can be one solution to this. Um, but what do you think are, uh, how can youth, younger people like me, can work on to fill these gaps? Well, exactly, exactly. I think this entrepreneurship is something that it is, it is based on students' own extracurricular activities. And uh, Euphra is also doing entrepreneurship uh, education every now and then when, once we have these events and congresses and conferences. So we have had several times these short courses for, 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 for young students. You can push your faculty, your professors, that please, could we have something like an extracurricular course if there is not yet a course on entrepreneurship? And could we, could we do it, for example, together? I don't know how easy this is. Uh, I'm not an expert of African universities. How, how, what are the possibilities that you could put it forward? But you may try. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nika, for this uh, detailed reply. Uh, we have. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I just wanted to add one something uh, to the question by Isabella. I realize Isabella is a, she's a student in the, uh, in the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. That is where I did my postgraduate studies. And uh, I, I want to give an example. In the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, 
at McKillen Forest, where the College of Forestry is located, Isabella. I don't know whether the Forest Product uh, Institute is still there. But yes, it still is. What you realize is that if you go to that institute, you realize there are so many products that the institutes deal with, which the student can take up and go on and start businesses using that. And that, that one happen not only in the University of Philippines, it will happen in many other universities. So the idea to me, and I think that is where uh, Europe, where we can be able to borrow from Europe, the aspect of collaboration and also realizing you can be able to be a job creator rather than a job seeker using the forest products. I think in Africa, we need to do that. In Asia, people need to do that. Rather than having the mind that after my degree or after my certificate, I'll go and start looking for jobs. That is why the aspect of entrepreneurship, teaching in universities become very, very important. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, it's, it's nice to have this connection here as well. <laughs> uh, great. Thank you for changing this perspective as well on opportunities. I see a lot of questions in the chat already and re uh, hand raising. So I suggest we keep a very short question um, next by Mary. Please keep the answer very short. And then we have one more question and then we open the discussion for the audience. So please, Mary, the floor is yours. Very brief question, very brief answer. Okay, um, my next question goes to Mika. Um, what are the key aspects a um, professor should work on to fill these gaps that we've been discussing so far? Okay, okay. Uh, let's 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 be uh, just focusing the most important uh, findings. They are related to gender, minor, minor other minorities. Uh, indigenous knowledge. Uh, so these are something that I, I have said, for example, that my I personally, being as a as a middle aged white um, heterosexual uh, Western uh, professor, it's really difficult for me to see what's going on. So, and this is, this is true for many, many professors. They don't realize uh, what are there happening in the grassroots level and with students and recent graduates. Mm -hmm. So they have to do the deep reflection. They need tools to get to understand the realities, which is hard to say, but if you do science, if you are there in the faculty meetings and mm. not necessarily uh, face the, the problems of, of young graduates and students, you can be outsider. So some tools for them to realize uh, what is needed. And these are sometimes double, double and, 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 and difficult issues to be raised, these kind of minority issues. So, and, and, and that is why they are there hidden. So long answer, but we need to have some tools for, for teachers to reflect uh, these difficult issues. Thank you, thank you Mika, for this uh, also like self-critical answer. Um, I would like to give the floor once to Minette again, and then we open for... I think you're still muted. Sorry, uh, thank you Vera for giving me the floor. I think the, the other questions and the answers of uh, uh, Mika and James have uh, kind of satisfied me. I, I think uh, I, I am happy. I, I don't have uh, other questions to, to ask and um, I'm looking forward myself to, to read the, the, the report and and see maybe from the report there are other research perspectives to kind of uh, you know find these bridges uh, between the two um, educational systems. So yeah, I'm satisfied from the side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the statement. 
Then I would hand over to Alex to moderate the sessions from the question and answer. We have some questions in the chat already and also some answers in the chat. So um, if you have a specific question, please always indicate to whom you ask, you ask the question. And yeah, Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Vera. Um, the chat has been bubbling and a lot of comments and ideas and interactions have been going on. And a lot of the question goes to Professor James and I'll quickly take them one by one. From Bodgan, uh, okay, I start from Mary. It was asking about forest enterprise that, uh, that are good or sellable in Nigeria or Africa in general. So Prof. James, what do you have to say about that? I don't get the question. Okay, it was, uh, the person was asking, what are some of the forestry um, businesses ideas that are marketable in Africa? <laughs> forest ideas, they are, they are harder than one, they are quite a number. And let me say that any forest idea or any idea which you know is going to solve people's problem will put money in your pocket. If you can think of any, any problem and facing the community and you ask yourself, how can this problem be solved? And then you come up with that idea, then you have already made money for yourself. So oh. I, I'm not there to say that this is a specific one because there are so many, but I'm saying identify the problem because if you are in an area where there is, you need to use uh, maybe, I, I know like uh, in our case, the business in uh, uh, selling medicinal plants like uh, from Prunas Africana. I, I know it is a big business in, uh, in, in the world, but not everywhere where you have that, uh, that product. So I'm saying, look at any problem and see using the forest sector, how can we be able to solve this problem? And out of that, you can make uh, you can make an entrepreneurship. You make money out of that. Okay, thank you so much. And just as a follow-up question, I'll take that from Juliet. And she put in the chat. She said, "Thanks for emphasizing on the importance of entrepreneurship. Many students want to find jobs after graduation, but don't want to create jobs for themselves." From the study by the EFI IFSA IFU project. I don't know the reason for that. It could be that they only have sufficient, they don't have sufficient knowledge on entrepreneurship. I guess we should all agree with her. And uh, another question from Mohamed, which is uh, my concern is how can we institute forest education in school? What are the strategies involved? Directed this question to Professor James. Yeah, how, I, how can we institute forest education in schools? I guess he's asking how can forest education be integrated into the curriculum in primary and secondary schools? Yeah, thank you. I, when it comes to forest education, at the primary school level, we may not teach it as forestry education. You may teach it in, you can give it so many other different names. You don't need to go to primary school and teach people about civic culture, but people can be taught how to grow trees, how to protect trees. Nature, nature study itself will cover part of the, uh, will cover a forestry. When it comes to the secondary schools, the same things apply. Before you come to the specific attach uh, at Tibet and at the university level. And this one goes by different uh, countries. I know, like, if it is in my own country, Kenya, when I go to the primary school, I'll find some topics covering forestry. To me, that is quite well and good, where forestry can be introduced at that early level. When I go to uh, secondary school, there is geography, but we can also have, in part of geography, maybe topics within that, or you can have an, uh, a, a separate unit on issues to do with forestry. Okay, thank you so much. 
I direct this question to Professor Micah. Um, it's from Undul Nkoli. How can students studying forestry in Africa, especially in Nigeria, have access to internship environments like other forestry students in Europe and other countries? The question is to Professor Micah. Yes, thanks, Alex. Uh, well, I think there are many, many catalogs and, 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 and these kind of platforms where you can find the programs in Europe when they have the, the application periods and whether they have uh, scholarships. They, they, these kind of a places are many on the internet. Uh, some programs have more uh, scholarships, others not so many, but I think there are many options and, and good students, they are getting those uh, places every year. It's, it's a hard competition, but uh, you, have to, you have to be patient and try to apply for many places and, and, and then do networking also in, in congresses and places and events like this, you can conduct also and discuss with, with professors that that might help uh, a little bit for you to get an idea what, what is needed for, for successful application. Yep. Thank you so much. Um, just to add, I don't know which school you are writing from, but some universities in Nigeria have some partnership with some European universities, especially in Spain, for Erasmus exchange. You could explore this option. I know it's often time competitive. Uh, I go to the comments of Dr. Fala, um, where he was talking about the forestry education uh, experts not inviting the policymakers to their meetings. What do you think, um, Professor Micah? About, about inviting policy make makers. Was that your comment or question? Yes, that yeah. uh, policy makers. Mm. Yeah. Um, just, uh, I, I remember, I think it is somewhere there in the report, in the main report, uh, global report, that you might have uh, these kind of a policy forums. Uh, it's not necessary that the universities are doing that alone, but they have to, they have to make a, a, a network and together, maybe some of the biggest universities, they could do that. Uh, but we have, for example, a nice example here in, in, in Finland. We have been running the uh, Forestry Academy for decision makers. So we, the, the, the system, the, the, the academy has invited only <laughs> uh, every year, let's say, the members of the parliament, some uh, top executives from all kinds of, uh, of branches of, of society, and it has been really a good place for those people to, to do networking and also to get to know the forest business. The idea is free to copy. <laughs> Alex, you're muted. Sorry. Some questions coming from LinkedIn and uh, to Professor James now. What would the curriculum in nature studies look like and how could it be rolled out in rural communities? How could the curriculum? Yes, be rolled out in rural communities. That is, how could it be implemented in rural communities? Okay, thank you. I, I think it all depends because if you are talking about uh, primary school level or secondary school level. These are institutions that mostly you find within the community. And I can say that it also depends with the different governments in Africa, because the methodology of coming up with a curriculum is, is different in different countries. Like I know in my own country, Kenya, we are coming up with what we call a competency-based curriculum. And issues to do with the nature conservation become part and parcel of what the students from primary schools are expected to be doing. But you find that it's totally different from another country somewhere else in Africa. So I'm saying that we may not have a general 
a, a, a general uh, prescription, but depending with the different countries. What I can say is that let's use what is there within the community to train people about forestry. Whether it is at the primary school level or whether it is at the secondary or at the TVET or at the university level, you can use the materials within the, 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 that particular area. The other thing that we also talked about is need to use videos where it is possible. Because now we are here talking with Mika, who is in Finland. You are in Spain. You, we can be able to see what is happening in other parts of the world using the videos. <laughs> we are, I'm talking with, uh, with somebody. You can be able to see what is happening in Asia and all that. So we say we can use technology in our training at the community level. But this will also be influenced by different policies in different countries. Because some communities in the rural areas, they may not have access to internet and what have you. And to me, that is where now we can't have a, a clean, uh, a clean uh, slate for development. It all depends with different countries. Yeah. May I just have a quick comment? Uh, so thanks, thanks, uh, James, what you said. Uh, new technology videos, they are there already. So someone has said that YouTube is the most popular platform for education in the world. And it might be true. Uh, what is missing in YouTube is that there is no quality control. Uh, we, with the science, we have used this uh, peer review, and that's missing. And this is exactly what we have to focus within the forest sciences and forest education, how to forward in terms of quality and how to how to how to how to how to do make the development with, with this respect. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we have quite a lot of questions and comments um, which we will not be able to go through everyone. I want to quickly invite Dr. Fala if he has something to contribute as regards this discussion, if he has more information to contribute. Dr. Fala is, a is an associate professor at the University of Lorraine in Nigeria. Dr. Fala? Hello, everybody. Hello, Alex. Are you hearing me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, thank you very much. I quite understand what we have been um, saying since morning, and I want to appreciate our two professors for putting us through the studies carried out in um, Europe and Africa. As Alice has introduced me, I'm uh, Fola Babalola, currently an associate professor of forest socioeconomic in Nigeria. I'm um, partnering with, um, I'm also with Micah and Sandra in a uh, forest education um, group in Ayufro, where we have been doing a number of work. We recently published a book um, under this um, forest education tax force between UFRO and IFSA, where we discuss a lot about how students in Africa can really build career, can build their future in forestry in Africa. One problem that uh, as an academic, that I've been an academic for more than 15 years teaching forestry, one problem that I've identified with students is most students want to be spoon fed. Most students these days don't want to see opportunities. They want you to feed them with opportunity without putting their effort to looking for opportunity. I'm so sorry to say this. Most students don't know that going to university is about building them for the future. It's about applying their knowledge into whatever they want to do in the future. It's not compulsory that you read forestry once you study forestry. This is what our professor of Africa has been saying. It's about entrepreneurship. It's about applying your knowledge, your skill, to do something even outside forestry. To be able to succeed these days, it's not until when you study something to be successful. It's not your certificate of forestry that some people, will, some students will even use to be successful in life. It's about how can you apply what you have learned to do maybe forestry or some other thing outside the field of forestry. One problem with forestry students is most of the time, they got into forestry not applying for forestry. 
a number of students, a number of students, South Forest are just a landing, a landing place if they don't get their first choice of admission into forestry at the university. Mm -hmm. So because they cannot study medicine, pharmacy, and all these courses, they found themselves in forestry. The first question they will be asking themselves is, where will I work? Where will I use this certificate to study? Or where will I use this certificate to, to be somebody in life? I, when I found myself in World Forestry Congress, we just finished um, having in uh, South Korea, the, the, the advice I gave to students there, to the youth all over the world, because I spoke there and I gave them an advice, is that they should just mind their business. Just build a career in forestry. If you are very successful in forestry, Bill Gates can even employ you in technology. If you are very successful in forestry, you can work in finance later. It's not compulsory until when you finish in forestry, you have to go and hand yourself in a jungle or in a forest. No. It's about how can you apply your skill to be successful in life. So don't just stick with where we like to work. But first, work on your grade. Work on getting very good opportunities, very good grade, very good um, skills when you're in the university that you can apply your certificate after you graduate. So stop asking us questions where we like to work, but start building the skill of how can I apply my skill? How can I use my skill? So this is what I want us to start thinking about youth. This is what I want us to start thinking about those people in forestry education. Just tell your students, think outside the box. Think elsewhere as you are getting this grade. Opportunity will come your way as you are building your skills. Mm. Then when the opportunity comes along the way, you can now, when opportunity comes your way, you can now apply the skill you learned in order to be successful in life. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much for this contribution. And it's also this um, like very creative thinking, which was also mentioned by James and the entrepreneurship, which is very important. However, I would also like to kind of raise the flag for the next generation that they cannot solve the world. <laughs> we also need the politicians and the teachers to help them. And we are uh, we're coming to an end. Uh, minute, very, very briefly, okay? One minute. Minute, please. Yes, thank you. So uh, talking about opportunities, I just wanted to briefly mention uh, the EU for EFI uh, Young Scientist uh, uh, Scholarship. Uh, I don't know, uh, maybe Daniel is there and can say something more in the chat about it, but it's a nice opportunity uh, for you guys. It's a small uh, scholarship, but I started with a scholarship to get uh, a position at the University of Göttingen and I was able to comfortably finish my PhD. So maybe you can, I mean, Daniel can write something on the chat, but it's a, it's a good collage. It's very interesting. You just need the host institution uh, for the student in Africa. You need a host in uh, Europe. And for those in Europe, you need a host in Africa or in Asia, de uh, depending on where you want to go. So please check it. No, thank you. Thank you, That's perfect. And this is actually the perfect um, bringing us to our last uh, point of today. So um, if you have an, an idea for a scholarship or an initiative you would like to share, and you haven't shared it yet in the chat, I, I've seen there are a lot of links already, please, uh, this is the moment to do so now. We will collect all the initiatives which are mentioned in the chat. And after this meeting, Alex is so kind to write a blog post. And um, in our blog, we will add all the links. So this is also a nice way to find out about more initiatives, about scholarships. I see Daniel is already uh, sharing the first thing. So please uh, take the time now. I hope you give me two more minutes before we finish the meeting. And you can uh, post in the chat um, if you have a scholarship or an initiative. And, uh, very happy uh, about the webinar and I would like to thank all the speakers and the panelists uh, for their time today. I would also like to thank the audience for this very lively discussion and I wish we had more time as usual, <laughs> but I think 90 minutes on a virtual meeting uh, should be sufficient. And um, I would also um, like to thank our um, technical assistants today. Santiago and Rosa were doing a fantastic job in the background saving us um, from the technical Zoom perspective. Thank you very much to both of you. And um, yeah, it was a collaboration between IFSA, UFRO and Forest Europe. 
And uh, we have more things coming up. So there's also a lot of information on the respective social media. So I invite you to follow us and uh, see if there's anything you are interested in. I also saw there's a lot of interest to join IFSA in the chat. This is fantastic. Thank you, Isabel, for replying directly to the questions. And yeah, I mean, networking, taking initiatives and uh, trying to really and broaden your skills is uh, very, very important. There's also this uh, so-called tree e-learning platform by IFSA, where you will find uh, online course materials, especially on soft skills and forest skills. So I definitely recommend having a look um, on the IFSA website as well. And um, yeah, just to give you a couple of more seconds to write in the chat if there's anything you would like to, um, to state here. And um, I hope you are all uh, satisfied with the webinar, even if your question really was not today, but um, it's usually the time limit. And um, let's see if there's anything more in the chat, but I think we're coming to an end. And with this, I would uh, like to thank you very much on behalf of Eufro, IFSA and Forest Europe. And I wish you a pleasant afternoon and thank you very much for joining our webinar today. We will also um, broadcast it later on YouTube, so it's available at a later stage. And on LinkedIn, you will have um, the, the biographies of our speakers as well, so you can uh, maybe even ask, uh, ask in the LinkedIn network later if you're interested. So thank you very much. And with this, I would like to close the meeting for today. And wish uh, you Vera and, and the picture. Maybe. Oh, oh my God, I forgot the group picture. Thank you, Santiago. Good, you're thinking. I, I'm so excited. Of course, if possible, we would take a group picture. So if you feel comfortable, you can turn on your camera now. Santiago will make a screenshot. We will use this for our social media. If you don't feel comfortable, please don't turn on your camera. But it would be nice if Santiago has some faces on the screen. And maybe you count from one to three, Santiago, so we know when to smile. Of course, of course. Let me see if there are more faces now. And so three, two, and one. You can tell you some are still coming up. Just more, more people is coming. Okay, I will wait uh, 10 seconds more. I don't know the chat, I totally forgot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do it right now. So uh, three. Two, one, now. Thank Great. you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for reminding me. Um, with this, I would like to close the meeting and say thank you everyone and good luck for all your future careers wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much, bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.